into their futures. Soldiers speak out. I'm with the uh, Veterans for Peace, Chapter 109, the Rachel Corey Chapter here in Olympia, Washington. You just heard in our intro, Soldiers Speak Out, and that's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, tonight probably is the most important program I think we've produced in 10 years. Tonight, we have a very special guest with us, Sarah Blum, who is an author, also a veteran like myself, and by our hair color, you can tell it wasn't this past year. We're both from the Vietnam right. days. Uh, Sarah served as a uh, decorated nurse in Vietnam, and uh, she has written a very important book. The book is Women Under Fire, and it's dealing with abuse in the military. And Sarah, I want to thank you for coming and being our guest. Thank you for having me, Dennis. It's great to be here with you. Well, now, Sarah, I, I mentioned that you were uh, a nurse during uh, Vietnam in uh, Cho Chi, or Chi. Cu Chi. Cu Chi, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, and that was at the height of the fighting in 1967. It was. Yeah. What, what did you learn from that experience that also is tying into the topic that we have tonight, women under fire, abuse in the military? Well, I was an operating room nurse there, and um, so I saw the worst of the worst in terms of what, what war does to our soldiers. Um, they could be wounded and on the operating room table within five minutes because of helicopters. So they were coming in because of where I was, on the edge of the Iron Triangle, beside the Hobo Woods, where all the fighting was in that, in that period of time. My hospital was the largest user of fresh blood in all of Vietnam. Fresh blood. Fresh blood. So that, I mean, that tells a story in itself. It means we were really busy. We were getting casualties all the time. We were part, we were supporting the 25th Infantry Division, Tropic Lightning, all the different units within that, and sometimes Big Red One, sometimes 82nd Airborne. And so casualties would come in. So one of the first things I learned was that the training that I had before I went to Vietnam prepared me a lot to be an operating room nurse, but it in no way did it prepare me for what I was actually gonna see, hear, and feel, the depth of it, the intensity of it, or that I was gonna have to do the same thing that surgeons did. Somehow they missed telling me that. Mm -hmm. So right away in the very beginning, we get these casualties coming in that ha were blown up by, like, say, Claymore mines, and they have wounds all over their bodies. And so the surgeon comes in, and he says to me, they're like, this is my first day. Which side do you want? Sir, which side do you want, right or left? And that's how I found out. And so I literally did the same thing that the surgeon did on those kinds of wounds. Now, when it came to like a chest wound, a belly wound, eye, face, then it was a different story. Then the surgeon was doing that, and I was basically handing them instruments. Um, and, and we also got mortared a lot. So because of where we were, we were between a petroleum dump, a Mars station, and an artillery battery. So we were like a prime target. And so we got mortared a lot. And I found out within a month of being there what that experience was like. I also found out that I didn't get to be in the bunker like the other nurses because the very first time that the mortars came in, I didn't actually know what they were yet because I hadn't heard them. And a soldier came in full battle gear and I was actually in the shower when he came. Mm. And he said, ma'am, you need to go to the bunker right now. And I said, okay. And I wanted to just rinse the soap off and you know, I don't, 
you probably remember, right? There's just like a water can mm -hmm, that's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so it doesn't go very fast, not like a shower here. And so it took a little while to get the soap off and it, I wasn't, it wasn't getting done. And so the, the poor soldier was getting more and more intense. Ma'am, if you don't go to the bunker right now, I'll have to carry you there. So I put my little robe on and kind of slip slide through the, um, through the hooch to get myself to the bunker. And I, I was in there just long enough for my eyes to adjust to the dark, see my chief nurse, and she nodded to me. And then she said, as soon as we get the all clear, you can go back to work, or everybody go back to what they were doing. And the next thing that happened was a soldier put his head through the door and said, we need Lieutenant Blum right now in the OR. Hmm. And so I knew from that day on, don't bother to go to the bunker because I got to go to the OR. <laughs> so I learned that. And so none of that really had anything to do with what I ended up writing about other than the very beginning of me deciding to write was really writing originally I was going to write about women in the military and what their experiences were yes it was way later that this got narrowed down to talk about the culture of abuse well and you've had quite a few years 28 years maybe plus of being a, a, a psychotherapist, but a nurse psychotherapist. Right. And probably when you were in Vietnam, you didn't use the term psychotherapist, although I'm sure you were called in uh, to comfort some of the people that wondering if they would see tomorrow. Well, actually, because I was in the operating room, I didn't get to do that there. Really? No, I didn't oh, get to do it all. because they were already... Because they came yeah. in and they were on the operating room table and we put them to sleep and we did surgery and that's kind of what I did all the time. But... When it was time to come home, I was very fortunate. I became the head nurse of the orthopedic ward at Madigan General Hospital here in Tacoma, yes. which is how I got here to Washington. And, um, and so, of course, I fell in love with it, which is why I'm still here. So at Madigan, as the head nurse of the orthopedic ward, that's when everything really started for me. That's when the wheels started going. So I got to greet my fellow soldiers coming home from Vietnam, and in fact, as head nurse, I never let anybody else greet the buses. I said, wherever I am in this hospital, if my guys come in, you call me, because I wanted to do it personally. I wanted to welcome them home, I wanted to offer them what we had to offer, whatever they wanted to eat. We would take phones, I had these phones, big, big phones, we could wheel up to the bedside, and um, they could have whatever they wanted to eat and make calls to home, and. We just wanted to make them as comfortable as possible. And, um, and in some cases, when they were going to be in the hospital for a really long time, I arranged to, for them to bring their wives or girlfriends in and gave them private rooms. And there were a lot of things I could do as a, as a captain in the, in, the, in the Army Nurse Corps and being there at Madigan. So what I was noticing was happening is that their physical wounds we're not healing the way physical wounds usually heal. Because all your nursing education said this healing process should, should take place during this time, yeah, and you noticed it's not. It wasn't. And I knew, intuitively, I knew they were all messed up in here, right? I mean, you, I lived it, so I knew, I knew what they must be going through as well. Before they ever called it post-traumatic stress Before syndrome. Before they ever gave it a name, mm -hmm. yep. And so I started talking to everybody I could talk to about it, like, this is what's happening. Why are, why are they not healing? Why is all this going on with them emotionally? I talked to the psychiatrist, the psychologist, the social workers, and then I talked to this, the orthopedic surgeon that I knew that I'd been with in Vietnam, and then he was the ward officer for the ward, which is how I got in that position which I'm eternally grateful for. It was like the best duty I could ever have had at that point in my life. And so I talked to him about it. He was like the first one that had any understanding. None of the other people did. And he said, look, I have an office 100 yards down the ramp in the clinic. Why don't you use my office here? Just talk to them. Talk to the guys, see what you can do. Because nobody had any help for them. No nobody knew what was going on. So. I took one of my guys who was um, wounded. He was wounded actually in Korea, and he had lost his, his big toe, and he had a long recovery period, and he, you know, balance was an issue. Surely. And, but he wanted to help, and so I gave him all my administrative duties in the office, 
And I said, you take care of all this stuff, and I'll just go talk to the guys in the office. So I was on the ward and in the office with them, and he did all the administrative stuff, which freed me up. And I would talk to the guys. And the other thing I discovered, besides their physical wounds on healing, a lot of them were impotent. No organic reason for that. Mm. But it was all... But they were. It was all the... The, the imbalance that they had, the, all the things that they believed in that were sort of, you know, shot to, to, to heck uh, because of their Vietnam experience, right? Yes. Nothing made any sense. And so I would work with them on all the issues that they had, and then I would give them, uh, if I could, if they were well enough, I would give them like a weekend pass, and I could always tell Monday morning when I walked on the ward, I could always tell if they were successful by the look on their face and, and how their body looked. Yes. They never even had to tell me. Now, most of the people that you worked with during that whole Vietnam era were male uh, soldiers. They were all men. Yeah, and, uh, and at that time, women in the military were women's army core and pretty much separated where today it's an integrated process and hence this whole nature uh, of the book that you have where things have changed right. much more exponentially uh, on abuse, although it did exist uh, during the 60s and 70s. It did, but, but not to the level that it is Not to the now. level it is. Right. When did you first become aware of... Uh, and I know you've dealt with psychotrauma type, you know, from yeah, a long time. Yeah, but when did you doing. first become aware that this is disproportionately affecting uh, women in the military? You mean the, the culture of abuse? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so let me back up a little bit just to give you the connections that I had for, for this writing. So in 1996, I was on the very first Vietnam peace trees trip, the first trip into the country of Vietnam to plant peace trees. Yes. And before we went on the trip, we had a gathering in Seattle. And Danon Perry, I don't know if you've heard his name, but he was a, he was a physicist, uh, and then he became a psychologist and a peace activist. And he was one of the prime people that was creating this trip for Vietnam veterans to go to Vietnam to plant peace trees. And do you know that organization is still there? Last week I was at the University of Washington at a charity fair and came across Peace Trees Vietnam and it says, I know you. Uh, one of my colleagues who has since passed, Carol Burns, did. Yes, Carol the, Burns. Yeah, and you know of her too. Yes, yeah, she made the video. She made the her. video on Peace Trees, yes, right. which won a number of awards yes, as well. Yes, right. And so there were some you know, fairly young Vietnamese people that uh, obviously they were not alive during the time when we served, right. but you know, they were, says, do you know of Peace Trees? I said, oh yes, I know them quite well. Yeah. And uh, I knew of Carol Burns as well. Yeah, I remember her well, very well. So it was the last gathering before the trip was gonna happen. And Danon was as close as you are to me right now. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, Sarah, someone needs to write the woman's experience in Vietnam. Uh. And I don't know if you remember, but it was a week later or so that he had a massive heart attack and died. So that was like the last thing he said to me. I get chills remembering that. Um, and so it, it really impacted me, but I was not yet, I didn't get it yet. I wasn't in that, in that frame or that, of mind in that mode to write. It was actually 10 years later, 2006. I was sitting having a discussion with a woman who was an educator, a very intuitive woman. And she said to me, in the middle of a conversation, she said, you know, you're supposed to be writing about women in the military. And you haven't done There's it. There's at least two people that recognize that. And you haven't done it. Uh, and I said, you're right, I haven't. And I need to get going with that. And um, so I did. So I, it was like right after that, it was like those two things just came together inside of me. And, and I think at that point I was ready. And so I, um, I, I asked for guidance to like how I was gonna do this. And I asked for, I asked for a name for the book, that uh, something that would inspire me and I could get behind. And, and that's how I got Woman and Under so Fire. That is 
Women Under Fire. That's right. how I got that. And, and where did you find that title? I just brainstormed. Okay. And I had a whole bunch of different things, but one of them lit up and it was that one. And so I knew right away that that was it. And then I, and then I said kind of just to the universe, okay, so now I need to know that I can actually write. And so I sat down at the computer and I said, well, let's write an introduction. And I hadn't done anything yet, right? But I just want to know if I can write. So I was just, just my fingers were just flying. And I wrote this introduction that it blew me away. I was like, whoa. Words just flowed. It was what was so intense, so powerful, and so like right on. And I said, I just said to the universe, okay, I'm in. Let's do this thing. And so then I had to try to find women. And so for three years, 2000. Six to 2009, I was interviewing women vets. How did you find them? It was not easy because we all like to hide. Yes. Right? I, I, you know, as you may know, I am an independent accredited VA claims agent as well as my colleague Mark here. Right. And women don't always step forth and say, well, here's the problem that I have. And right. it's, you know, military sexual trauma. Uh, and... Yeah, so not everyone wants to tell their story. No, because they get triggered when they tell it. Yes. Yeah. Or, and then you know, or not telling their story is their way of dealing with, I, I'm doing okay by right. not telling my story, but they don't get healed either. Right. So for the three years, 2006 to 2009, I was not focused on abuse in the military. I was focused on women in the military from World War II all the way up to that current day, which was Iraq, and then I wanted to get their stories. Okay. And so I was not focused on abuse at all. I, it was I just simply want, women in the military, but and not, their abuse, stories. not abuse as a topic that would coordinate right. it all. No, no. But I, I had a regular set of questions that I would ask each woman, and one of the questions I would ask is, did you feel respected? How were you treated? And then some of the stories started to emerge from that, but I, that was not my focus. My focus was women's service. In fact, one of my chapter titles was women's service and pride. Um, and there were, so there were different categories that I had for the different women and their stories. And then, so this is three years, 2006, 2009, and I put messages out wherever I could, every women's veterans organization. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Uh, websites, bulletin boards, wherever I could. And whenever I talked to a woman vet, I said, do you know any other women vets? So I just followed it wherever I could. And uh, in 2006, uh, 2009, I went to the Pacific Northwest Writers Association mm -hmm. Conference. And I decided, after listening and learning about writing, this was the second year, I decided to have somebody look at what I'd written so far and give me feedback. Uh -huh. And it was a man. And he, he, he changed the course of my life completely by the feedback he gave me. He gave me a tremendous amount of feedback, very detailed, very specific. But there was one specific thing he said that just rocked my world. He said, look at these stories you have about abuse in here. He said, this, what you're doing is too broad. It's not going anywhere. Look uh, at the stories about abuse. You need to focus in on, and he said these words, the culture of abuse toward women in the military. And I did not know that there was such a thing. Mm. I did not know. And so that set me on a course to begin learning about that. Re I read everything that had ever been written about sexual assault in the military, everything. I mean, I have folders and files all over my computer all about that subject. And of course, then I started interviewing. So, so what happened was I had to make this shift from where I thought I was going to where I started to go with his feedback. The other thing was I had all these stories of other women who had PTSD and who were dealing with that. And I had my own story, which was very detailed in there, like six chapters of my story. Mm -hmm. None of those would, were going to fit into this book. So I Even had, though sometimes the PTSD is related to the military sexual trauma, but not all it comes PTSD. At, it comes as a result of the military sexual trauma. Yes. Yeah. So I had to take the book and literally split it apart hmm. to get this, to start with this. Well, one thing, Sarah, I want to 
uh, alert our viewing audience is this is not a uh, book that you want to sit down late in the evening and read um, as something to relax you and go to sleep. I tried that several times. Then I found my blood pressure raising yeah. as I was starting to get angry mm -hmm. with the culture that, you know, I was privileged as a male and did not see a lot of this. I have heard a lot as a claims agent of mm -hmm. that. And so I was aware. And then hearing these stories, I could only take about three pages at a time mm -hmm. and put it down right. and just think about this and then become more firm that this is one of the most important programs that Veterans for Peace is going to tell our world today. And this book is well written, but it's also a challenging read too. It is that, and I tell people that. In fact, I put a few notes in there, I think you probably saw them, for people to help people along if they get to a certain point and, they're, and they're, it's too intense and it's too overwhelming, how they can focus their reading so that they can handle actually getting the gist of what's in the book. I caught that and yeah. I appreciated that. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's difficult to read, but imagine what it was like for the women living through that. Um, and I do want to say that um, this um, abuse that happens in the military is, on, is not only to women, it's to men as well. Yes, as a matter of fact, I was just talking with a person who was a former military uh, police, said um, from his records and the research that he's had, 53% of the uh, male uh, particularly enlisted, are um, sometimes uh, victims themselves of uh, sexual trauma. They are, in fact, and often men... unreported because, hey, I'm a man, right. you know, and right. I'm the not going to report this. Right, the men don't report, and I've actually met since I've been doing this work and traveling around. I've met a number of my brothers who've been sexually assaulted, men who served in the military. Um, and sometimes communicate with them online. Well, and I've treated people and helped them with benefits. The wife was present, married for 30 years. Never and then knew. he says, oh, by the way, I, I was raped when I was 17 years old, such and such, when I was in the service. Just, And the wife's mouth went, you know, in all their married years, he would never share that. Right. And it just came out, and she was. Yeah, the men just, don't talk about it at yeah. all. Um, and there, and there is actually a film uh, that people can access it's called Justice Denied, and that's um, about male uh, sexual trauma uh, survivors. So our audience can Google Justice Denied and right. find more about that. Right. Now, you had to learn a little bit about the culture, the present-day military culture. You experienced that as, as a, a nurse in the operating field during Vietnam, but this whole military culture today has changed since women are now integrated into all the services. Yeah, and, and what I learned, because I was really focused in on the culture of abuse toward women, mm -hmm. so I really focused in on that in my research, and when I was interviewing the women, I wanted to really get at that information. And so what I discovered is that there really is a culture of abuse toward women in the military, and it's, it's worse than ever right now. Uh, this culture of abuse undermines readiness and morale in our military, mm -hmm. and it destroys the health, the lives, and the careers of our valuable women soldiers. And so, their families. And their families, mm -hmm. yeah. Why is this abuse there? Where are people learning this? It has to be somewhat of a learned behavior. I don't see it somehow. How does this happen? Um, at least from so, your perspective, how do you, how uh, so do you see is, it? So there is, there is this, there is this um, sense of entitlement that men in the military have. There's a combination of things. There's that sense of entitlement, along with the the attitudes, the male attitudes, and uh, so so many many men in the military have this attitude that is arrogant, dismissive, disrespectful, demoralizing toward women, very disrespectful. They believe the military belongs to them. It is their military. Women do not belong there. And they are going to show them through their violence, through their heinous acts, how much women don't belong there. That's why they use this term, this man's army. Yes. Or so you'll hear that phrase. Yes. So 
the, this attitude is very widespread from the lowest to the highest ranks, and they use, they use um, coercion and intimidation tactics to, to get women to have sex with men of higher rank, and they believe that they are entitled to have that, like they see women as government property for them to do with as they please, and so they believe that no woman has the right to say no and stop them from having whatever they want. When I interviewed, I interviewed an 85-year-old woman who was a World War II vet, and it was actually up in Linwood, Washington. Amazing woman, and she was a journalist in her time. And during the interview, she leaned over to me and she said, you know, honey, we were there to service the men. That's what the women are in there for. To service the men. World War II, she told me that. Uh, and so the numbers have escalated in re recent years. And there are commanders, there are soldiers, there are doctors that are raping our women, that are, that are sexually assaulting them in the most gruesome ways. And they're proving Th this attitude and this culture abuse that I, that I knew was there from all the research and from doing all the stories. It, there's just no question about it that that's happening. And so I, you know, one of the things that I really want to be able to say is that rape by soldiers, commanders, doctors, and gang rape of our women in uniform must stop. Yes. And in addition to that, the military leadership that silently condones that has to change. What percentages are we looking at? I mean, I would see this as taking this information and marching down to the recruiting stations, of going to the counselors in the high schools, of saying, are you aware when you promote the uh, opportunities to serve, particularly for women, that here is the percentage or the possibility what are we looking at as far as the Number, reality? Numbers? Yeah. 26,000 a year. That's the latest number. I think it's more than that. In fact, 26,000 a year is the number we have, and we know that that's probably 20% of what's actually happening because of the issue of reporting. So that's seven. if we just take that number, that's 71 a day, and that's one every 20 minutes that one of our brave service members is being sexually assaulted. So in 2012, it went up 35%. 35% in that year. In 2013, it went up 50%. Now, what the military is saying is they're saying it's because of better reporting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It I, never happened before. You know, it's just yeah. better report. Well, it's always the same. It's just better reporting. Right. It's I, not really worse. We're just telling our story more now. I don't believe that for an instant, that yeah. it's better reporting. I, I agree that there probably is more reporting happening today, but the increase is the increase. And so, yeah, it's, it's very rampant. It's very rampant, and it's got to be stopped. And that's actually one of the key reasons that I got on board to write this book. Well, now, this whole area of abuse in the military is not totally sexual in nature. It's power, is it not? It is power, and it's power over. And that, and, but it's connected to that attitude of entitlement and the attitude that men have, arrogant, dismissive, disrespectful, demoralizing, they have that attitude and they, they violently sexually assault women as a way of letting them know they have no place there. It belongs to them, the men. Hmm. And uh, the, the, the military's way of handling it has been just really not, uh, not helpful at all. They're, they're cold and harsh in, in relationship to them. And you know, there's, whole many, there's many, many issues that we talk about, but the, the, the military is not handling it well. The attitude, the men's attitude is too pervasive. Mm -hmm. And I have not heard anything from the military that convinces me that they have the goal of changing that culture of abuse. They talk about changing their training. They talk about mm -hmm. changing how they do certain things. But I've never heard anyone from the military admit, acknowledge, 
this culture abuse or that they're going to do anything about it. Because many of the leaders in the military are covering up for these sexual predators that are there. They have a target-rich environment with all the women. You know, 15% of our military are women. 15% now. 15%. Our military could not survive without women. And they're very competent. And the, the uh, I lost my train of thought, but they're, um, without the women, the military could not function at the level that it does. But yet, this culture of abuse is really undermining the image of the military. And so what happens with officers is they are very protective of their careers and of the image of the military. So that's why there's a cover-up and they don't want it reported that these things are happening, particularly not in their command or on their watch. Mm. And they have a conflict of interest when they have two soldiers in their command and one of them is the rapist and the other one is the, is the victim. And how are they going to handle that? Well, what they've been doing is covering up for the rapist and standing on the side of the rapist. So where does that leave them? It leaves them in their camp. We hear the terms uh, assault, abuse, um, rape. There's a, there's a whole bunch of terms. In your interviews with the veterans, what type of... Uh, abuse in the military did they experience? Well, let me, so I'll give you some of the stories. I'll just, give you so I'll give yeah. you some what, what the, the stories. appetite for, for our viewing audience of, these are, these are stories of real people. Real this is people. not made up. Yeah, they're real, very real. Um, so uh, just to kind of set the stage here, over and over in their stories, they tell me if they report sexual assault, or if someone else reports it on their behalf, they are punished harshly. The perpetrator is protected, promoted, and permitted to continue their heinous behavior. And often on the same post as what they are. Yes. Mm -hmm. Victims are isolated, ostracized, shamed, humiliated, treated very, very poorly. 62% of the women who report sexual assault are retaliated against severely. How, so how are the women soldiers who are around them, how do they treat them? Or do they don't come to their aid e either? If they can, they do. They do. But what happens if they do come to their aid? They, become, they get shipped off somewhere. Oh, That's what happens. I'll be. Yeah. So uh, I'll give you a few stories. So um, Sharon Mixon was a 21-year-old decorated combat medic in Desert Storm. She was deliberately drugged and raped by American soldiers when she was processing out of Dharan, Saudi Arabia. She had finished her tour of duty, ready to go home. Mm -hmm. They deliberately drugged and raped her, and then they threatened to kill her if she told anyone. That's the level that we're talking about. Now, that's 1991. I'll give you a story from 1960. An army cook, a woman who was an army cook, she was gang raped by four soldiers who took her into the woods on the base where they were. And she was very feisty. She was kicking, screaming, yelling, biting, everything she could do, four of them. So much so, they had to put their knees on her arms to keep her from fighting them off. Mm. And so they raped her, all four of them. They continuously raped her. They beat her unconscious. When she regained consciousness, she was bruised on her head, her neck, her jaws, her arms. She was bleeding down her thighs. She had to first get herself oriented to figure out where the heck she was, what had happened to her. Once she did that, she was able to get herself out of the woods and to the road where some military police uh, saw her and they took her to the hospital. So in the hospital, she was treated and she was treated very well for her wounds. Then CID, criminal investigation, oh, took yes. over. They interrogated her from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., five days a week for six weeks. And they threatened her with dishonorable discharge if she did not sign their paper saying that she would not press charges. Hmm. Uh, how about a Navy one? Uh, Nicole Kurt was in the Navy. She was a 
a uh, damage control firearms apprentice. And she was on a ship, and on this particular night, she was on watch. One of her fellow soldiers in the same, on the ship, uh, cornered her in an isolated passenger way, sexually assaulted her. She decided not to report it. But what she wanted to do was she wanted to talk to the new chaplain that had come on board. So she made an appointment, she went to the new chaplain, she specifically asked him for confidentiality. He said yes. She told him what happened, she wanted some support. And then he went to the command and reported what she told him. Didn't take long for the whole ship to know. Exactly, but the next day, the rapist went to her and said to her, everybody on ship is looking for you because the commander asked that the chaplain uh, show the source of the complaint. So she was ordered to go to the commander, which she did, she went to the commander, and she was told the things that he, that he said to her, among which was, you need to cooperate with NCIS, right? That's the Navy version of yes. CID. So she did cooperate. She cooperated in all the ways, but they wanted her to sign a statement. And she read through it, and the statement was full of inaccuracies and omissions, and she refused to sign it. And they kept badgering her and badgering her, and she kept refusing to sign it because it wasn't accurate. And finally, through the command, she was told, if you don't sign it, you will be dishonorably discharged. So what's she gonna do? So she signed the paper. Then what did they do? They demoted her, they fined her, they restricted her to quarters for 60 days, and then they gave her a less than honorable discharge for serious misconduct on her part. Yeah, she was an immoral person. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of thing that's happening. Well, who are these men that commit these sexual assaults on our female uh, personnel? 95% of these men are serial rapists and repeat offenders. 95%. While they're in the service or even before? Even before. 95% serial rapists and repeat offenders. What does that tell you about what's in our military? So they'll, cal they'll sit with the commander and they'll calmly claim the rape they did was consensual, consensual. sex, mm -hmm. and the commander believes them. If there's a confession, it comes out of the 5% that are not sexual predators. Oh. And so what they do with a confession is they ignore it, and they instead charge the woman with making false statements. It's a system-wide problem, it's so a culture. So even though there's a confession, they just ignore the confession and still charge. Right, and they make the women's lives miserable. They, they retaliate in so many severe ways that they destroy them, their health, their lives, their careers. They, no. they take them out of their positions that they've earned. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they deny them medical care. Uh, there, like one of the stories, uh, let me tell you about this, a petty officer, woman petty officer in the Navy, she was on port of call and she was raped by, two, by a couple of sailors and they raped her repeatedly. She, after they were done, they put her in the shower and they washed her, they dried her off and they put her clothes on her and then they shoved her out of the hotel. She's in a state of shock, she has no idea where she, where she belongs, mm -hmm. what's happened to her. She's wandering around the streets, and eventually she found her way back to the hotel. She found somebody that she knew and trusted, and they took her to the military police, from there to the sexual assault coordinator, and finally to a doctor for a medical exam. Mm -hmm. The doctor, in the middle of the exam, he started to cry. He was so distressed and distraught about the extent of her injuries. So. She was then put on a medical ward in the Navy, right? She was imprisoned there on the ward. She was imprisoned there and denied food. Denied food? Denied food and denied any other care. And then when she was released back on ship, she was on call 24 hours a day and not allowed to leave the ship. So that's the level of severity and retaliation that we're talking about.
And so, yes, there's this criminal element in the military, and here they are, and they have this target-rich environment of 15% are women in the military. So they can have at it, and then they have the protection of the leadership. Well, I was working with a, a client who said that, in essence, she was held captive uh, for the flyers, the Air Force pilots. Yes. And... Uh, and only brought up forward, and she was beaten too, yeah. but only put up at the front desk so other females could see this would happen to you yes. if you said anything. And, you know. Yeah, they make an example of them. And so now when you try to get any uh, benefits for this person, it's, it's very difficult. And in some cases, what we've also run into, Sarah, is after a while, they don't even want to admit to psychotherapists what happened to them because it just opens up again that whole trauma and they get re-traumatized in a therapy session and so they often will deny right. this ever happened. Right, it can, but if, if, it's, if it's a psychotherapist that really knows how to work with trauma, yes. they don't have to have that kind of reaction. There are ways to work with people, even military sexual trauma uh, survivors, so that they are not re-traumatized. Yes. In fact, when I was taking their stories, I worked with them over the phone. I literally worked with them, and if they got triggered during the time that they were telling their story, I would work with them right then and there. You were providing I, therapy, although you were getting their stories. I put the story aside for the yeah. moment when they were having that reaction so I could work with them and help them through it. And if they weren't able to continue right then with the story, I didn't. I just said, we'll do this another time. But there are ways to work with people, soldiers with PTSD and MST, as well as women, and help them work through it without going directly to the trauma. That's like one of the last things you do. You have to build up their inner resources yes. to get them to the point where they can handle that trauma. Most of our viewing audience hasn't heard a lot of what we're talking about. There's been a lot of military cover-up. Why don't you address a little bit of what you ran into? Because it's sort of like our military would cover it up? Yeah, they do. So I mean, I'll tell you a story. 2003, mm -hmm. three women died in Iraq of dehydration because they would not drink liquids after a certain time of night because if they did, they'd have to use, use the latrine. Yes. And between where they slept and where the latrine was, where these big loud generators, where all the rapes were happening. And everybody knew it because you couldn't hear their screams. So these women thought they would, they would rather risk death than the possibility of being raped. And so they literally died in their cots in the night of dehydration because of not drinking the liquids. So you cover up. So the next day, Colonel Janice Karpinski is yes. in the room yes. when the deputy commander he listens to the doctor talk about these three deaths. So the doctor comes in and reports the deaths to the deputy commander, and the deputy commander says, well, don't say anything about this because we don't want to bring attention to this problem. This is almost like an order. Do not talk. Right, right. And that's why our viewing audience are not hearing these stories. That's why, and, and I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, for a long time the media was in collusion with the military on this because they would be like, 1991 there was the tail hook scandal with the yes. Navy, and so there was a little bit of a splash in the media, and then psh, all went away. Then you didn't hear anything. Didn't hear any more. 1996 we had Aberdeen Proving Ground, which was the Army scandal. Psh, it was all gone after that, right? 2003 was the Air Force Academy. And it's only really been in, in the recent years, and even for me, so as the author of this book, and writing articles and writing op-eds, every single time I wrote an op-ed and sent it to the Seattle Times. How many times did it get published? <laughs> Never. 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 Yeah. And so on a lot of other writing, there was, you know, the one place where I found that they would actually put my things out was the truth out. Truthout. Truthout.org. That's where they put a lot okay. of the writings. Truthout.org. Yeah. Well, what happens to women who have actually been sexually assaulted in the military? And, well, just generally, what happens to them? You've interviewed all of them, and each of mm -hmm. them have a different story of right. how their life had changed. And, 
you followed up sometimes years later, you know, what has happened to these women? Well, it starts with the feeling of betrayal. So they go into the military and they go to basic training, whichever branch it is, because it's all branches, um, and they are told from the very beginning, these are your brother's soldiers. Mm -hmm. They are your brothers. They will protect you. They will have your back. They will keep you safe. And so then what they experience is they experience their very brothers assaulting them. So it's incredibly traumatizing for them. And, and the military sexual assault, because of that betrayal, because of that feeling, and then the, because of the way they're treated when they are sexually assaulted, uh, it changes everything, totally changes everything. I mean, it's a very severe personal and physical violation to them. Mm -hmm. They may never feel safe again, and they may never feel safe again around men. Um, and they, uh, they have a hard time thinking, they have a hard time processing information, they have a hard time getting back to their life. They may or may not have therapy, but a lot depends on how they are treated when they report this experience. The way the military does it, they're very cold, harsh, indignant, no protection, no support, not even a proper investigation or prosecution. Like, there's no accountability. And, and what women need instead is they need a safe place that they can go that's designated for them as a sexual assault victim to go to where there's somebody, a nurse preferably, that knows how to do a, 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 a really a complete forensic examination mm -hmm. because that's a big part of the problem. If there's not forensic evidence, uh -huh. then they so can't So it never process. happened. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So they need that. They need compassion. They need respect. They need a safe place. They need to be understood. They need to be understood that they cannot give a coherent start to finish story at that time because of the trauma and what it does inside to their brain and their nervous system and the connection between their bodies and their brains. Now, you've talked to some of the women and getting their stories that are no longer in the service and some several years have gone by. How are they dealing in the civilian life as a result of what happened in their military life. Many of these women are literally afraid to go anywhere. They're, they they leave, they live uh, as a, rec lives, a recluse. Yeah, they live as recluse. And they have, they have all the symptoms of PTSD, very intense symptoms. Uh, some of them will go to the VA for medication. Some of them won't. Uh, they have a terrible time going to the VA because Someone, some male is bound to say something to them that just triggers them all over the place. And often they'll never mention MST. They'll say depression or anything else that, you right. know, they might get meds or some right. psychotherapy for, but right. not what drove them in that, that place there. Yeah, right. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. What needs to happen to end this whole culture? Because we're talking about a whole culture shift. That's right. You know, and and there all the services. Are there any services that are better than others? That there might be a possible shift, or are we looking at this whole endemic problem? It's every every branch. It's every one. It's every one of the services. Um, and and you know, if the leadership in any or all branches of our military truly taught respect for women and meant zero tolerance for sexual assault women would not be perceived and treated in the disgusting ways that they are today. But it is all the service, and I have to tell you, when I was writing the book, I got to a point, I don't remember exactly when it was, maybe 2010 or 11, I got to this point where I had, I had every service represented except the Coast Guard, and I th thought to myself, I was actually sitting at the computer, I said, well, at least the Coast Guard's clean. The very next day, I got an email from a Coast Guard woman, and it sort of opened those gates, and, the re and then I got other Coast Guard things. And so it is every one of the services. So up until now, the military has gotten away with investigating themselves. Ah. And that's yeah. got to stop, because they are far too self-protective to investigate themselves. So we need some outside body to do thorough investigations within the military, how they mishandle sexual assault cases. 
how they deal with protective orders, how do they manage protective orders, because they're very bad at it. Women are literally murdered, killed, while there's a protective order in place. Yes. Yeah, so we need to, f we need to get that information and, and for this investigation to really look at the entire system and how it works and how it doesn't work, whether or not there's any accountability, because usually there's not. And so that whole thing has to be investigated. We need a, a thorough cleansing of the military. We need to get rid of the entire criminal element that's in the military right now. In 2003, when George Bush decided to invade Iraq, they opened the doors to criminals. Yes. And they flooded in because, look, it's a way better than prison. And look, there's all these women there. Yep. And so we need to get rid of the criminal element. Um, they need to hold offenders accountable. They have not been doing that. They have to punish criminal behavior. They have not been doing it when it comes to sexual assault. Now, these are all things that the military needs to do. Let's put on a different lens and say our viewing audience needs to become involved in that. You and I are quite passionate about this issue. Right. How can we get a viewing audience to be part of this movement that changes the culture? What are some specific things that they might be able to do? They're hearing our program and then right. saying, I'll read your book, you know, and they can see how to get the book at the end too. Right. And they read this and they say, I want to help change. What can I Great. do? So they can get on the phone. I say phone rather than email, but they can do email as well and contact their representatives and their senators and especially the members of the House and the Senate Armed Services Committee. Okay. I actually went to Washington, D.C. last November and met with as many as I could personally and with their staff, and I talked to them about this problem, and I gave them the list of what they need to do to change this culture of abuse toward women in the military. And then I went back in December and took a copy of my book with a personal note inside to uh -huh. each one of them, members of the Senate and House Armed Services Committee. So the public, now that they're getting educated, I hope that they get passionate as well. And if they know anybody that's in the military or going into the military, it's not safe there for women, period. And for men, if they don't have a solid set of values and they go into the military, they can be brought into this culture that exists there and feel like one of the boys, right? So what the, what the public needs to do is contact their representatives and their senators and the members of the House and Senate Armed Services Committee mm -hmm. and tell them that they have read the book and that they're appalled at what's been happening and that it's got to stop. And they can be very specific and say the military needs to be held to account. They need to start holding criminals accountable for their criminal behavior. They need to clean out the criminals that are in there now, find a way to clean them out, find out who they are and clean them out. Um, and then they need to take reporting sexual assault cases out of the chain of command because as long as it's in the chain of command, women are at risk. Mm -hmm. They're not going to report because they're either reporting to their rapist or to someone that's covering up for the rapist. I know that in working with uh, uh, senators and um, representatives that if they take on an issue that we present to them, that the uh, military has 10 days to respond because of a congressional action. Whereas you and I may approach the military and, you know, our great grandchildren can say nothing has changed. Right, exactly. Whereas they can come under pressure from uh, oversight type of thing. And they, they yes. tend to do some things. Yes. And so I think we've hit upon the key of if we start flooding our representatives and these special committees yes. uh, and given them the stories that we're, we're hearing in women mm -hmm. under fire, yes. that in they fact, will do that. In fact, the public can say to them, you have a copy of this book. It was given to you in yes. December. Have and you read it? Yes. There are messages in there for you that this is what you need to do and they can give it to them, give them the bullet points. Right? Hold defenders accountable, punish criminal and behavior. And matter of fact, in that last part of the book, uh, Sarah, you 
give a lot of resources uh, on what people can do, on where to get help, right. you know, and related articles type yeah. of thing. Yeah, and it's also on the website. The website is womenunderfire.net, and there's a whole list of resources for women. Women under fire. Dot dot net. Net. Right, and there are a lot of resources on there. You can get the book on there, but there's also a lot of resources for women. And there's and I have a blog. There's blog posts. I mean, I have people from all over the world that read the blog and send me notices about it. Well, how can people support the work that, from what I can figure out, you're the single <laughs> voice. I'm the voice in the wilderness. The right? voice in the wilderness, <laughs> and saying, "Whoa, there's an awful lot of things there." How can people support your mission uh, and I know buying the book is one way to start well, but what are some things help. that uh, we're part of Veterans for Peace and so as you I heard know. the story or song there are soldiers speak out yes. we have a, a, a story to tell yeah. well you've heard the story tonight yeah how can we help support I think doing something like this we're creating avenues for me to be able to speak be, to speak this message so more and more people get educated. I think that's probably the key thing. Um, and yeah, buying the book, telling people about it, sending people to the website, that's, that's what comes to mind. Well, and not only will it be on your website, but we can post things on Veterans for Peace. Uh, the chapter 109 has VFP109 rcc.org and that rcc mm. is the Rachel Corey chapter oh, so okay. vfp 109rcc.org and we like to post things there so that Great. we can be collaborating together yeah, so to I can share send this you, information yeah when i write articles and things so like i i recently wrote um i think it was september 22nd i wrote something in speak out on truth out about domestic violence and connected some dots for the general culture as well as the military culture and this whole idea of the culture and the, the level of entitlement among men. Uh, I talked about the uh, boys in Steubenville, Ohio, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, football the football players, players who raped the young girl and believed that they would get away with it because their co coaches would back them up. And that's, the, that's it in a nutshell. That's what happens. And so it's everywhere that it's in our culture as well and it has to be rooted out. Well, one of the things I hope that this program goes, it's, it's being streamed right now on YouTube as we speak there. So Great. it's going out for anyone that subscribes to YouTube, you know, will see this particular one. But I, as a retired educator, um, would like to see this get into the hands of the counselors in the schools. Uh, because we know that the recruiters come into the military schools all too easily. Oh. And yet if the counselors were very aware of the abuse in the military and the percentages that it has, and then they're looking at these 16, 17, 18 year old, uh, not only female, but male, that right. this would be, you know, something that, you know, we could get that message out. And there's a big problem with recruiters. That's it's also in the book. Recruiters are actually raping, sexually assaulted young people before they ever get into the military. a matter of fact, today I learned of what happened in Alaska, where uh, there is one school district uh, refusing to allow recruiters to go to school because that's exactly what's happened. And it's increased uh, on that one. Well, Sarah, we have just about a minute now, and I want to see, is there one closing thought that you could share with our viewing audience? Women are some of the most competent members of the military that we have. They're very dedicated, they're very strong, they're very focused, they listen, they read the training manuals, they function at a much higher level than a lot of the men do because the men will do like just enough to get by whereas the women want to succeed and for a woman to get into a certain position she has to be like five or six times better than mm -hmm. any man to make it there so they're very excellent competent service members well sarah i want to thank you for sharing with us on this very important topic and a topic sometimes hard to hear hard to talk about, but one that we want to engage the viewing audience and in changing that culture of abuse that we've talked about tonight. And I want to thank you for coming. Thank you for watching.